Good to see you. I uh, have a, a little bit of a guilty pleasure I'd like to uh, confess. Uh, I like, I mean, maybe I should ask uh, how many here like to read science fiction? Oh, that's quite a few. Okay, so I'm not alone. When I was a kid, I was crazy about cross science fiction. What was really amazing for me was the way that these authors, Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac Asimov, they just pulled out their creations out of, out of nothing. I need this super force. Poof. I need this super machine. I need this super material that can do things I want. And the difference because, be, between them and what I do now as a researcher is that when I do things like that, there will be 10 people telling me that. That's not possible. That's, you know, you can't do that. That's, you know, that will take a long time to, to realize this sort of thing. And we have the next funding round to think of. Science fiction is fantastic. So let me just try to switch off all the criticism and just dream up something really cool. So, this. This is really, really cool. Well, maybe not Vita Wrap or Kitchen Foil in itself, but if this was a display, it would be really cool. Think about this. This would be like, okay, so maybe I should, should show you the other thing I have here, which is also kind of cool, but not quite as cool. So this is also a display. You can show columns, things like, but drop it, it would break. It's not flexible, and it's certainly not foldable. But this stuff is. Think about if displays was something you could put anywhere you wanted to, on surfaces, on yourself. You could have what in the science fiction movies is like the configurable room, the configurable thing that can show the colors you want, information you want, you could bring it with you, you could, it could be the ultimate graffiti experience. Everything you know could just be changed in terms of the color information. Of course, that's a wild idea, and I already can hear my colleagues complaining about it. <laughs> so, but that's before we give up. Let's say, take a look at what we do have, because we do have an amazing range of materials. This is the history of humanity, going from left to the right. Wood and stone, I mean, seriously, I mean, if you took the, take away the wood now, you would be in some kind of trouble, maybe me too. Onto iron, uh, onto copper, and then later bronze and steel. And finally, in our information age, we have plastic and silicon, and, and everybody knows what silicon did for us. So that is a really powerful collection of materials why don't we just make that, this kind of displays out of that? The problem is that they don't, they don't do, none of these materials really can, can do it, and in combination they can't do it either. Metals are conducting but not transparent. Plastic can be transparent but it's not conducting very well. Glass, uh, you know, it can't conduct a current. So no matter which combination you do, take of these materials, you can't have what I just showed you. Because, of course, you would have to, such a screen would also need to be extremely strong. It will also need to be able to conduct electricity. So, the question is, what do we do? Well, uh, luckily, about 10 years ago, two Russian scientists, they found out that there was actually a possibility that such a material could exist. And it was the most unlikely of places, because they found it in the tip of a pencil. So, if I take my charcoal pencil, I have it here in my pocket from yesterday. It's got, okay, like this. So it's an ordinary pencil, and I write on paper with that. What I will get out of that is some black stripes, but if I put it into a microscope, I will see there are some tiny flakes hidden in there. So these tiny flakes, this is the material I'm talking about, which is called graphene. It's a derivative of graphite. The way it works is that graphite is really consisting of these two-dimensional sheets, not thin, but two-dimensional sheets that can slide on each other. So when the pen cr cross uh, over the paper, you're actually just sliding these sheets uh, uh, against each other, just like a paper in a, in a block of paper can slide. So this, this, is, this is quite amazing. What happened 10 years ago is that for the first time, we were able to access the individual sheet and study its properties. And then we went in for uh, a lot of uh, surprises. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about, what this material is, and hopefully uh, uh, contaminate you with some science fiction fantasies of what this material can do. Because it can, it's only in its infancy, and we need you to think about what it can do in the future. So welcome to Flatland. 
This is a carbon atom. It's a very undramatic little thing. Only six electrons, very tiny. But what happens is if you allow it to mingle with other carbon atoms without hydrogen or oxygen or this kind of stuff, then it actually, or every carbon atom's dream is, oh, please, one day can I be part of a graphene? Because it's the most <laughs> amazingly stable material. Every material will always try to find its most stable state, and this is amazingly stable. These carbon atoms are so small that the covalent bonds between them are like fantastic strong. And the other thing is about this kind of chicken wire uh, grid you can see here behind me, it's, it cannot crack. So, you know, metals with, uh, you have a fatigue, fatigue and the things and glass and it's brittle and it cracks, you have a crack that propagates and suddenly you have two parts, doesn't happen. So this hexagonal shape kind of prevents the cracking. It means it's extremely resilient. So if you look closer, you can think of this uh, these, uh, carbon, these bonds between the carbon atoms as tiny springs. They're just very strong. And the strength of this is something of the order of 100 times more than steel. That gives me at least one point for the science fiction fantasy I started out with. 100 times more. What does that mean? I mean, steel is pretty strong as it is. I mean, you would be surprised how much weight you can, you can, uh, you can have if you have a cable like this. It's, it's, it's tons, probably. But graphene is something different. Just let me expand your imagination by having this imaginary graphene sheet. Down there we're having a hammock made that's one meter wide and two meter long. It's a hammock, it is made entirely of graphene. So that means it's one atom thin. That's not a lot, I mean, seriously, what, you know, it's strong and so on. But if you put a cat on it, about four kilos, it will keep it up. But the weight, is the same as one of the whiskers of a cat. Now think about that, what that would do to what we use, how we usually think about materials if we had access to something that worked like that. Now if we look from the side, so this is the sheet that was from the top and now we see it from the side, that's why the, you only see a stripe of atoms, it's actually a sheet that kind of goes into the plane. But uh, it happens that the carbon atoms, they're only spending three of the electrons in making these spring connections. For every atom, there's one electron left over. So what should that do? You know? And then it's, it turns out that the, all these electrons, they kind of talk together because nobody wants us. So it turns out the way they can help the structure the best to create the most stable structure is to spread out and roam this full sheet. So first, they kind of get as far away as they can from the other electrons. The electrons tend to want that. And then they are kind of they are able to uh, skate around on the surface. And they do that so well that graphene is a better conductor than anything we know. It's just like, a, it's like Christmas evening. <laughs> so now we, have, now we have this material, and the, that means that the... This is to give you a picture of how, how, how much different it is. You take a copper, which is about the best thing we can use for cables, and the same thickness, but made of this material, graphene. The amount of current you can put through it until it breaks is a thousand times higher, higher for graphene. One ampere and a thousand ampere in the same diameter cable. The electrons almost don't feel resistance, so they don't dissipate heat. So it's, 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 it's virtually a very cool material. So the last thing we needed was it, it was transparent. And you can obviously you can see that graphite is very transparent, right? Graphite is just like, eh, you can just see right through it. Absolutely not. Actually, I have a bit uh, of a setback here, but the point is, that the graphite is, in fact, uh, transparent if you make it thin enough, and graphene is extremely thin. So one sheet of graphene will actually block 2.3% of the light, and that's a lot in absolute terms. But, you know, because just one atom is th thin, and it still blocks 2.3%, but, you know, if it's just thin enough, it will work. So one sheet of graphene will still let 97.7% uh, 90, uh, through. So it's, it's okay. And did I say that it's very thin? Yeah, so let me take this. So this is a 90 nanometer of kitchen foil. And this is 10 micrometer in, in, in thickness, just about. I read it on Wikipedia, I actually didn't measure this one. And uh, then I'll say I thin it down 40,000 times. That's how, how much thin I have to make it in order to, be, to become as thin as graphene. And I start to, to roll it out and see how, how long it now becomes, because obviously it will become much longer if it's 40,000 times thinner. And I keep rolling, you know how it's a bit, with, with, it's a bit difficult, so okay. So these are some problems with graphene, obviously, because if this was 40,000 times 
thinner, this will also be 40,000 times harder. Actually, it will be long enough to go to the pyramids in Egypt, this roll, if it was graphene. But if I tried to do it, I would look very funny, very quickly, because this would just wrap me and not uh, get me anywhere. So this <laughs> probably not a good idea. But that, that kind of, because it works much better if we have, I'm sorry about that, if we have the graphene, um, this is all the pocket here. So uh -huh. I have some graphene for you. So, so this is actually sub graphene supported, not just supported, but also grown on a copper wave. I see if I can not can drop it, because a student will kill me if I do it or so touch it. So, this is a copper wafer, and on top of this, there's a single layer of graphene. So I can lay, leave it on, or I can take it off. The taking it off is actually difficult, but it can be done. And if I take it off, put it somewhere else, I can start to try to make electronics or something else out of it. I can actually start to make prototypic transparent displays, which I am doing. Not alone, but fortunately with people who know how to uh, do the, all the rest that is hard. So, uh, some of you might think, I can't blame you for that, that graphene, ah, oh, that's just the Empress new clothes, and you don't know how right you are. Graphene, <laughs> think about it, it's thin, it's incredibly strong, it's transparent. And the Empress is saying, yeah, this is, this is cool, this is what I want. But what about rain? What about rain? Well, actually, uh, graphene is... Um, is a perfect barrier for atoms and molecules. Not just perfect, nothing can get through it. It's what, one atom thin, but it stops even hydrogen. And we've tried to kind of blow up uh, graphene balloons, and we can't break them. We can blow them up, but we can't break them. That was some, some extremely exper interesting experiment that showed you nothing can, can get through. It's a perfect barrier. And then not only that, so let's say, okay, so let's take this wafer I had before. This is not an actual wafer I can eat. This is uh, our name for a silicon disk with, uh, with some stuff on. So if I put this on top of the roof of some tower in Copenhagen and leave it for 100 years, it will look the same. Because nothing can get through the graphene. So it protects against corrosion. It protects it very efficiently against corrosion. And the wonder of it is, because there are other kinds of corrosion protect protection that works well, the wonder is that it will... It, I, I, maybe it's better to show you. So this is a, uh, a two copper coins. It's all about money, you see. So these are two copper coins, and uh, they are, they're cut together so they look like one, but they're actually two different coins. And they were treated a little bit differently because, before they went into the hydrogen peroxide, which is a strong oxidant. One of them was coated by graphene, in the same way that, as the, the disk I showed you before, and the other was not. So, interestingly, the one that was contaminated by our graphene looks perfectly like copper, and the one that was unprotected and clean, it looks completely dirty. So, and, and when you really go into the stu detailed study of this, you find out that the copper is behaving exactly like naked, raw, clean copper does. It's like the surface energy, that is how, is a bit like that, what kind of a way that liquid spreads on the surface is as if the copper was clean. We never see clean materials except for gold and a few others. All the we, see, we never see iron. We see stuff that is corrosion on iron or other coatings. So this is actually real copper that will stay like this, and this is a tendency that graphene has. It stops the corrosion, but it lets the physical properties through somewhere or somehow. So it's a bit like suddenly being, having access to materials that we have never been able to really touch or, or see for long before they are covered with corrosion. Maybe you can't, the copper still kind of looks like copper, but you can, if you do chemical uh, analysis on it, you can, I know, and, and use it, you will see that it's actually damaged. So I think it's a really interesting perspective that maybe there are some materials we've given up on, but could actually could be used because it could kind of be kept, uh, kept clean and kept alive uh, for, uh, forever, maybe. So, flatland, it's all about money. And, and you know, as a welcome to Flatland, but it's also a battlefield, so I feel a little bit bad about that. It's a battlefield because just last year, there were 3,500 patents in this field. That's, that's quite a bit. On an emerging field, there, was, there are no uh, big uh, uh, applications yet. I don't think there's any, any other technology that has, been, uh, that has been pushed so hard before that even this is the first uh, real uh, uh, applications. Three countries own two-thirds of these. Korea, China, and the US. Europe is trying to uh, get started. We are, it's, it's, uh, so, and that, you know, 
It's not complaining or anything. Europe has done something very great recently. They've launched something called the flagship project. That's a, a 1 billion euro project, like focusing on, let's get back in line, let's do some, do this, let's take graphene from the labs and move it out in the world. We're just, just, just not the only ones doing it. So only this year, I'm involved in four different projects, uh, one of which is this graphene flagship, and they are all focused on this. It's a huge effort. And, and to be honest, I think there's a lot of creativity, a lot of uh, ingenuity in, the, in, the, in all of these projects, but they're all kind of, many of them are quite short-sighted. I don't see the visions, I don't see the, the science fiction ideas, I don't see the really long-term ideas uh, as much as I see this kind of, let's make the little bit better transistor, or, or maybe make a slightly uh, improved uh, cell phone screen. So I think that here, there is a really, really positive, it's, it's a bit, you know, it's not, these people are not stupid, but we are inhibited by the, the backpack we have. We carry all our methods and experience and all our training, and that everything we see, we see with the perspective of things we already know. That's normal for persons. We go out and exploring, and what you're exploring is only your own uh, prejudices. And we have so many of these. We've, there are people who have done solid state physics for 40 years. It's very hard to see something brand new coming out. But that, that, that's, the, that's a key issue. We, we might find something we're not expecting, but do we notice it, or do we just see the, the thing that is almost like... You know, that's the saying that if Erste, he had went to the research council back then and said, I have this idea that can change the world. You can think about light and power and things like that. And there was another person saying, I want, if you want more lighting in the street, I suggest this candle that has two, two threads rather than one. Oh, yeah, that sounds like a practical idea. We can do this in three years. So we need the people, we need the ideas that reach further. And just to give you a perspective on, on that, there are two persons, two of my, my heroes and from science fiction literature. I have also heroes outside of science fiction literature. But nevertheless, Schultz Verne, he suggested, oh, it could be awesome if we took this kind of capsule, put people in it, and shot it to the moon so they could visit it. Across the emptiness of space, it's just a matter of making it airtight and, you know, a few things. But a little more than 100 years after, Neil Armstrong got out of his capsule on the moon and took the first steps. And I, that was like many, already many years ago. And that's, I mean, that's a thought Hughes Van conceived in 1865. In 1945, Arthur C. Clarke, a famous, another famous science fiction writer, why don't we do communication with satellites? In 1945, he said that. And now nobody thinks anything of it. I mean, how many people, I don't know, have smartphones with GPS? I have one, I'm probably there, like 50 or something. This is amazing. It works. So it's worth trying to make these crazy thoughts. And sometimes it doesn't have to be 100 or 50 years before they're realized. And that's where you come in. Because maybe it's not me, kind of professional researchers like me, but people who, with imagination and technical insight, interest, with curiosity, that, can, that, that will do the job. And I think we need these kinds of ideas more than we need the, the small ideas. So Einstein said, or didn't, I don't know, he said that imagination is, uh, is more important than knowledge. I think I would add curiosity and will to, to, uh, to do something to that, otherwise it won't work. So with that, I hope you will uh, go out and think about graphene and, and make some inventions. Thank you. <laughs>